Welcome to church, folks. Good morning. Uh, it's delightful. It's a delight for all of us to be gathering together to uh, begin a new week by worshiping God. Uh, and for those of you who continue to join us online uh, via YouTube, a sincere welcome. Uh, I'll just share a, a few couple of announcements as we begin our worship this morning. One that's not listed on the announcement that we actually, uh, it, was, it, was, it was missed, is that next week, as part of the we haven't done this for a while, but as part of the Presbytery program, uh, we will be doing a, a, a pulpit exchange. Uh, and uh, 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 Reverend uh, uh, Pastor uh, Daniel Martinez from St. Andrew's uh, Duncan will be coming to lead the services here next Sunday. And I will be traveling down to Duncan and to be leading the service uh, in St. Andrew's. Um, uh, Pastor Daniel uh, was called to uh, St. Andrew's Duncan um, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, after about two and a half years of searching and praying by the congregation, uh, they, are, they are thoroughly enjoying his ministry, and he's also enjoying uh, his ministry uh, at Duncan. So we look forward to having him lead our services. And I also look forward to uh, meeting, uh, cause, because I was the interim moderator there for two and a half years, uh, I look forward to visiting them again and to see uh, and to worshiping with them. So just update you on that. Uh, some of you will have noticed that there is a sign-up sheet for the World Day of Prayer that's coming up in a couple of weeks on Friday. Um, it's just to get a very, very, very rough idea, an estimate, a guesstimate of the numbers that we can approximate. Uh, it's all in terms of just food preparations. So we're left with a few extra sandwiches at the end of the day, or we're a few short. That really... Uh, but we just wanted to have a general idea of how many people are coming so that in preparation for the fellowship and things, the organizers would like to, to have some sort of a ballpark idea. So uh, writing your name down isn't, isn't, a, isn't a commitment um, to anything like that. So if you're, if you're, so please consider in signing. Uh, and if, if you don't come later, that's really, it's, it's not that uh, big of a, an issue. So uh, don't be too burdened. Oh, oh, she says, yeah, you sign up, you come. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible study continues. Once again, the reminder for the uh, drive through uh, baby shower donations organized by our friends across the street on the other side uh, from the Church of Ascension is there. Um, let's begin our worship. Turn to Christ who calls us here. Plus, place your trust in God who protects our lives. Lean into the spirit as we worship in spirit and in truth. Our first hymn today is Simply Trusting Every Day. Please stand if you are able. <laughs> Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, Trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Sightly doth His Spirit shine into this poor heart. Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever befall, trusting Jesus. 
Christ, that is all. Singing, if my way be clear, praying, if the path is drear, if in danger for him call, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting Him. While life shall last, trusting Him till earth be past, till with on the jasper wall, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Next one we're going to sing is called Standing on the Promises of God. So we're going to stand. <laughs> Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises be Greater in the highest I will shout and ring Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises now no can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. 
please have a seat. God of miracles and truth, bless us as we gather for worship this morning. Bless us and be present with us and shower us and pour out to us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Reveal your presence in our midst and open our hearts, open our minds, so that we would be receptive to the miraculous love that you offer to us and to the rest of the world. Increase and strengthen our faith today that we may go forth as your faithful disciples, as your witnesses to this miraculous love, this wonderful love that you have shown to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Answer us, O God, as we now turn to you for mercy and strength. And listen to the yearnings of our hearts and the regrets of our lives. Comfort us in our distress and pour your grace into our lives. Redeem us with your love that we might rise with Christ, newborn and vibrantly alive. And grant us the confidence to witness to your life-giving, this new life, this hope-giving love that you have demonstrated on the cross. Help us to be faithful disciples of that. We pray all this in Jesus' name, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I'm reading from Job chapter 1, 1 to 12, and then Job 2, 1 to 6. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to his face, to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. On another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? 
Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. God of word and wisdom, the risen Christ opened the minds of his friend to understand the scriptures. Send us your Holy Spirit now to open our minds to receive your truth and love, which can fill our hearts and change our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm not an architect, but at least the little that I know, if you're building a house or if you're building a massive skyscraper, uh, the architect intentionally designs a certain amount of flex and bend in the structure. Uh, they know that if you build it tight and stiff and very, very, you know, very rigid, then that building will fall and crumble at the onset of an earthquake or, or a you know, gigantic you know, st windstorm or strong winds or something to that effect. Uh, I remember when we first, back in the early 70s, moved to Toronto, uh, we lived in an apartment that was on the 27th floor of a 29 floor apartment. That's pretty high. Uh, have you ever lived that high? No, not in this, I don't think there's anything like that here in Vancouver even. Uh, and when the winds really picked up, like really strong winds, you can look out the window. I remember just a little kid, and you can focus on something outside, and then you can see, you can feel the, the building going back and forth. Uh, so it was not fun. Uh, I think the same kind of wisdom applies to how we deal with the storms of life as well. Uh, we can try to keep a very stiff upper lip and pretend that nothing is wrong, that, you know, you can trust in your own, uh, your, your own inter intestinal fortitude, you know, the wherewithal that you've got all built within you, the strength that you have, your resilience, your tenacity, all of that, and you're going to pretend it doesn't exist, and, you know, you're going you're gonna to fight on through the storm. But I think in certain cases, eventually, you'll snap, and you'll break, and sometimes permanently. Uh, not a wise strategy at times, nor is it advisable. Uh, the wisdom is to be able to be pliable and supple in, in a similar kind of a way. Uh, we need to be bendable to God, to pliable to God, to trust in God's wisdom and God's guidance, to keep the faith and to maintain our hope in a, in a, in a sovereign God, and it's with this reverence for God, for God's wisdom, and trusting in, in God's wisdom and God's sovereignty that uh, we can sort of begin our five-part series look and reflection through the book of Job. Now, um, where, where does this book lie in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures? As we might, well, I might know, a Jewish tradition has divided the holy books, meaning the Old Testament as we have it now, into three sections, main sections. The first section is the law, right, or the Mosaic laws. The other word we use is called the Pentateuch, right, meaning five. Uh, those are the five books, you know, the first five books of the Old Testament. And then the second section is the prophets of the latter or the former or the latter prophets, all of the prophets, the major and the minor. And we went through 12 minor prophets a couple of months ago. Uh, so that's the another section, third section, and then the, the and second section. And then the last and the third section is usually called and classified as writings. 
uh, more, more commonly referred to as wisdom literatures. And those books include books like um, a Job, Ecclesiastes, uh, uh, Proverbs, Psalms, and Song of Songs. So those are usually classified as uh, the writings or wisdom literatures. And Job falls into the category of wisdom literatures or the writings. So that's where the book of Job sits in, in sort of a wider picture of where the Old Testament, how they're sort of laid out. Now, wisdom literature by its nature is usually associated with a, with a, a wise sage-like, sage-like personality or a figure uh, who offers a really special insight into the, into the more practical human condition, which includes, in our case here, human suffering, and also joy and happiness and all of that as well, as Psalms might attest to as well. So both the entire spectrum of the human experience, the practical daily sort of living struggles and the things that we go through, the, the wisdom literatures has something really practical and something wise to say about that. They've reflected on life, and this is what we get out of it. And that's and what, whatever they glean, whatever sort of wisdom that comes to them uh, is what, what is shared in the literatures, of, of the wisdom literatures. So that's where we find Job, and that's how we can sort of set it. When it comes to, so in, difference to, in contrast to uh, a prophet's per se, like a proper prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, when it comes to religious and moral concerns in the life of Israel, it was generally the priests and the prophets who dealt with such things and wrote books in the, in, in the we find recordings of it in the, in, in the Old Testament. Sages, the kinds of personalities and the writings that we find in the wisdom literature, is more, are more fic, uh, pra, uh, focused on practical affairs of how life should be guided at times, though difficult it might be, though ambiguous and sort of here, neither here or there kind of experiences that we might have, wisdom literature contributes to that area of our life. So it serves a different kind of function. The uniqueness of sages who minister to Israel is that they reflected on all the complexities of life not just in terms of just general life experience, but they reflected the concerns of our daily challenges in our lives uh, based on in light of God's presence in our life, in their daily life, and, and God's special revelation to the people. Right? The aim was how should we live in God's world in relation to our very practical concerns of life now, today? And if I were to sort of sit down with you for a half an hour coffee chat, I'm sure we can all come up with a whole pile of list of stuff. Things. Oh, yeah, I've, I'm dealing with this and this and this. And I can share with you my own list, laundry list of stuff. right? So it has something to say and offer to that. So with the wisdom they offer, including the book of Job and, 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 and Job's life, right, was a practical insight for everyday daily living. Very different than intellectual head knowledge and reflecting on the complexities of life and faith in God, the wisdom offered at the end is that wisdom in such matters will lead to a flourishing life, both for the individual, for myself personally, and for the community that we live in. God's special revelation, God's wisdom, can bring meaning and insight and a way forward if we are pliable and bendable and flexible and reverent to God's sovereignty. I hope and I, I pray that we can appreciate then the hope and the wisdom on life's challenges that we can glean from these writings. Uh, you know, we all joke that, you know, a book like Job uh, can be a real depressing book, that it offers us nothing but grief. You know, there's nothing but sad and bad news, one disaster after another. But as we hope to discover, that certainly is not the case. That certainly is not the case. The book of Job starts by establishing the fact, as we've heard this morning, 
What kind of a, it, it characterizes Job in a certain way, right? What kind of a person was Job? Upright, upstanding, faithful, loyal, just a stand-up kind of a guy, just a, a very dedicated and a faithful man, a godly man, an upright man, blameless in his character, right? Who lives with reverence and holy fear of God. And it's repeated over and over again in the first two chapters that we heard this morning. His character reference is absolutely stellar and is beyond reproach. There is a reason, I think, why the book begins with such an extensive praise for Job. The practical daily concerns and experience is that even in such cases like Job, and to such a godly man, even to a person like Job, utter catastrophic things can happen. So, how are we to make sense of it all, and what can we learn from Job's experience? Although we didn't have to read uh, the rest of the chapters of chapter 1 and 2, the second half of chapter 1 and 2, let me condense that for you and to give you sort of a, a, the full extent of the blowout, uh, the, 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 uh, of, of Job's life, where, where it goes. We all know. Let me just really run that, quickly run that down for you. All of Job's servants, along with all of his oxen, thousands of oxen, right, and donkeys, they're all killed. Fire destroys all of his sheep and his servants as well. All of Job's camels and servants are killed by, quote-unquote, the fire of God, meaning probably lightning and fire, right? And finally, in chapter 2, all of Job's... Uh, all of, all of Job at the, at the hands of evil men, all of his servants are killed by natural disasters. And just like that, Job's life and all of his prosperity is gone overnight. And you talk about having the rug swept out from underneath you to be blindsided. So what's the solution? What's the solution? You begin with a glimpse of God to understand what is happening here on earth when life seems to be so extreme. You begin with God. Satan then intervenes and claims that, you know, you know Job's going to cave in. When it really, really matters, he's going to cave in. He's going to turn away from you. But God allows Job to go through the trouble because it will prove Job's heart that Job chose God more highly than any other earthly possessions or even his loved ones when he loses all of his children, when even at the threat of losing his life. Satan is proved wrong, and Job refuses to curse God, but continues to worship God and blesses God. And here comes more fuel to the fire. Job himself is personally tested, and he's afflicted with a disease, and he's covered with boil-like sores, it's too gruesome to explain or to describe, or to even try to envision what that might look like. Further on, Job's wife is now. How is she going to take all of this? What do you figure? She's incensed. She's infuriated at the unfairness of what's happening to her husband, to her children, and all of their hard-earned wealth that they've accumulated. It was the last straw, and she tells him to curse God. Verse 9, his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job's confidence in God is platinum solid, and he does not succumb to the temptation to turn away from God. Most of us may have had our moments when we were so tempted to do the same. We all have heard at times someone like Job's wife's voice, another voice in our head, instructing us, enticing us, tempting us to, to curse God 
because it was just not fair. You did absolutely nothing to deserve what was happening. We should be resolved, just like Job, whether it makes sense to us or not. Whether it makes sense to us or not. Let me repeat this again. Whether it makes sense to us or not, be like Job, worship God, bless God, and depend him for life, for everything. The wisdom is when you experience utter catastrophe, praise God, not curse God. Does that make sense? To be honest, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, we live in an economy that incessantly promotes the ideology of equal pay for equal work. To get back in life just as much as you put in it, and if you buy into this logic, then at times it leaves God's grace and God's love and God's mercy and God's compassion out of the equation of life. There's no room for God to intervene in our scheme of things. Our our philosophy on our perspective on life is is a closed loop system where it makes perfect sense, right? It, It makes perfect, rational, logical sense without God. There's no room for God in that equation. You get back what you put in it. And if you don't get back what you feel that you put in it, thereby fully deserve and what you think that you have a right to, well, then you have a cause to fight back and claim that you're, to, with the most extreme examples, you know, my, my basic human rights have been trampled on or one or the other. That you've been offended. If the disaster is the result of my own doing and fault, I think we can accept the consequences, right? But what do you do if I didn't do it? It's not my fault, God. I did everything that I was supposed to do, joyfully, obediently. When I read Job, I get a sense that Job does not really care to fully comprehend the reason for his troubles. That is not the wisdom of the book, nor should it be ours. Much of our counseling sessions and psychology is based, in modern day psychology, is based on the premise that there must be understanding, that you have to understand it. Job's posture of submission to the ways of God is diametrically opposed to modern conventional principles of psychology. He doesn't ask for a rational comprehension. He admits his ignorance, and he still remains loyal to the ways of God. You know, if you read all of the first two chapters, the writer repeatedly states, Job did not sin with his lips. He did not charge God with wrong. He continues on in that, in that, in that line of tone of voice. Friends, I want to encourage you to join me in joining Job to celebrate the perfect and absolute sovereignty of God. This is our way of saying God is good and God is in control. I may not fully understand, nor is it a priority right now, because my God is much, much, much bigger than what my head can get, it, get its head around or understand or comprehend or to accept. This is not theory. This is not theological teaching or information. This is not historical background or context, contextual kinds of things. This is our daily living experience. And we need to use it and apply it in our everyday living in all the practical situations that tempts us to take matters into my own personal hands and to take control. To be honest before God 
means that we are free to take our fears to God and our tears to God. And rightly, we should. Actually, we shouldn't take our tears or our concerns or fears to anyone else but to God and to God only, to begin with God. In chapter 1, verse 20, this is what is recorded of what Job does. At this, Job got up when he heard all the news, right? At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's room, and naked I will depart. Meaning, none of this is mine. I possess nothing. This all belongs to God. I came with nothing in this world, and I will leave with nothing, nothing from this world. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's Job's reaction and response to the utter catastrophe that happens in his life. Bring your grief and your tears to God. And lastly, refuse to let adversity rob you of the joy of the Lord that dwells in your heart. Refuse to let adversity rob you of the joy of the Lord that dwells in your heart. And I close and I conclude with this last verse from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Our next hymn is My Faith <clears throat> Looks Up to Thee. Please stand if you are able. <clears throat> My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary. Remove, oh, bear me. Sin. 
safe above our ransom soul. As God has given generously to us, we are now invited to give back to God generously. May our hearts brim with love and joy and generosity as we enter this time of offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. Generous God, God of love and God of grace, bless these gifts with your abundant love and your life-giving grace. Bless us now as we bear witness to your love and bear witness to your grace in all that we say, in all that we give, in all that we do. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. Let us pray. Tender Father God, how thankful we are that you hear us when we cry out to you. When troubles come, you give us strength. When our distress, when our worries, when it seems never ending, You are our quiet center. You are our wisdom. When we feel weak and lame, you raise us up to new life in the hope that Jesus offers to us. You put gladness back into our hearts, and you give us joy, you give us hope, and a future. God, we now bring our broken, unjust, and warring world to you today. Even as we see in our television monitors of the wars, the bombings, the hatred, the violence, the wickedness and pure evil that we do to each other. We long to see your justice and peace on earth as it is in heaven. We long to see people flourishing wherever they may be. We long to see your righteousness flood our world. We pray for all those who are in positions of power. We pray for politicians whose decisions affect so many. Give them wisdom and courage in the issues they choose to tackle. Give servant hearts, we pray, all the way from local counselors to presidents and prime ministers, from those behind the scenes to those on our screens each day. May the well-being, the peace, and unity of all love for our brothers and sisters be their goal. So, Lord, in your mercy, may justice and peace reign in our world. We pray for all whose power, who has the power and who uses their power to shape and control people's lives. For those who, like the Pharisees, limit and bind people rather than freeing them, those who act in their own power, blind to the healing love of Christ. Open their eyes to your spirit. Open their hearts to your spirit work in the world. And thank you for all those who use their knowledge and power for good, for those who are willing to stand up and speak truth to power, for those who risk their own lives to help others in distress, for those who quietly come alongside the broken and abused and lost and the hurting. 
In all these things, guide us in the ways of justice and courage and to continue to trust in the sovereignty of our Lord every step of the way in our journey. And may your vision and your hope for the world infect everything that we do and that we say. In your name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn today is, I Know Not Why Such Wondrous Grace. Please stand if you are able. I know not why such wondrous grace to me God has made known, nor why unworthy as I am Christ claim me for his I've committed unto him against that day. I know not why this saving faith to me God did impart, nor how believing in the word brought peace into my heart. persuaded that Christ is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing me of sin. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that Christ is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Friends, how fitting it is for us to confess with song that we really don't know the way the ways of God works. How the beauty of salvation and the gift of offering, his love and his grace, all of that works. But there is one thing that we do know, is that if we continue to trust in the ways of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is able to do all things, we can do that through Christ. We are witnesses of God's love. We are witnesses of Christ's life. We are witnesses to the power of the Holy Spirit. We are witnesses of life and love in the Spirit. So go forth as witnesses of the blessings of our God. Oh.